Hi, I'm Quillwing History, and today we're going to talk about the thoughts and achievements of the pre-Socratic philosophers. The scholarly literature I will be using will be listed in the description below for further reading. In this video we will cover the early Greek philosophers philosophical and scientific achievements and their relevance to the history of ancient science. To fully understand the achievements of the early Greek philosophers, we must first understand the worldview that had existed before them. The world before the pre-Socratic period was the world of Homer and Hesiod, and it was drenched with the divine. The gods and humans shared a common history, and natural phenomena was not seen as the inevitable outcome of impersonal natural forces, but as mighty feats willed by the gods and it included all aspects of nature, including spectacular events such as storms, lightning bolts, winds and earthquakes. This was a world in which nothing could be safely predicted, because of the boundless possibilities of divine intervention. However, during the 6th century BC, a new wind was blowing in the eastern Mediterranean, as the city-states of ancient Greece experienced a burst of a radical new kind of discourse, and it included a new kind of speculation, unprecedented in its rationality. It was concerned with evidence and acknowledged that claims were open to dispute and needed to be defended. The questions that were starting to be raised by certain people in the Greek world ranged over a broad subject matter including the structure of the cosmos and its origins, the earth and its inhabitants, celestial bodies and phenomena such as earthquakes, thunder, lightning, eclipses, disease, life, death and the nature of human knowledge. What separated these thinkers from the thinkers of earlier civilizations was not only that they posed new questions, but also because they sought new kinds of answers, and the most radical difference were the rejection of supernatural explanations to explain natural phenomena. Whatever these early Greek thinkers might have thought about the gods of Greek mythology, we don't know, since nearly all of the information we have available about their thoughts only consists of small fragments scrabbled together by scholars. What we do know however is that they left the gods out of their explanations on how the world operated. Why did this new discourse arise in Greece one might ask? There are of course several factors involved, but one of the most important one is likely to have been politics. The scholar Geoffrey Lloyd traces the origins of Greek philosophy to the intense political debates that raged within the Greek city-states, where multiple factions were often in disagreement with each other over a variety of issues. If two factions were to resolve a dispute without tearing each other apart, they realized that they needed to go back and find first principles that both groups could agree on, in order to have a platform where arguments could be made according to rational principles. Lloyd argues that these principles would later come to be applied to the study of the natural world, and thereby give birth to the Greek philosophical tradition. Our journey through the intellectual development in the early days of Greek philosophy takes us to the coast of Aeonia in today's Turkey. In the Aeonian city of Miletus there lived a man who was history's first recorded philosopher. His name was Thales and he's famous for being one of the first persons to theorize about the underlying stuff that makes up the universe. He rejected the polytheistic worldview of his ancestors and proclaimed that there must be some underlying matter in the universe from which everything else is composed and which persists through apparent change. What is this underlying matter you might ask? Water. Well of course it fails. He argued that everything material can be reduced to water. In fact, the earth itself once emerged out of water and has been floating around like a cog in an endless sea ever since. This theme of speculating about underlying matter or stuff was continued to be developed by two younger philosophers who were also from the town of Miletus, called Anaximander and Anaximenes. Anaximander rejected Fale's idea that water was the fundamental stuff of the universe and instead identified it as Aperion, which he proclaimed was a substance that was spatially unlimited and undefined, which basically makes it unlike any other known substance. 
Anaximenes, on the other hand, went another way, and instead claimed that air was the fundamental stuff that the universe was made of, and he explained that air is rarefied and condensed to produce a variety of substances found in the world that we experience. Anaximenes thought that if air becomes more spread out, it becomes fire, while if it becomes thicker, it gradually turns into wind, then water, stones and earth. While these three early philosophers had varying ideas about the underlying reality of the universe, they all had at least two things in common. First, they were monists, in that they believed that all substances in the universe could be reduced into one single substance that lasts through change. And they were also materialists, in that they thought that this substance was material, and not spiritual. This metaphysics of monistic materialism was expanded upon by various schools of thought that succeeded the philosophers of Miletus, the most important one being the Atomist school. This school of thought was founded by the philosophers Democritus and Lycippus, who argued that the world consists of an infinity of tiny atoms, moving randomly in an infinite void. The atoms exist in an infinitude of shapes and sizes, and by their motion and collisions they create and destroy new worlds, and account for the great diversity of substances and phenomena we see around us. Of course, not all philosophers who lived in the pre-Socratic era were monistic materialists, nor did they remove the gods from their worldview. The philosopher Empedocles of Akragas, who was a contemporary of Lycippus, rejected the materialistic worldview, and instead identified the fundamental stuff that made up the universe with four elements, or roots as he himself called them. These elements were fire, air, earth and water, and all things in the universe were made up of different combinations of these elements. Now according to Empedocles, the material ingredients alone could not explain motion or change, a problem that we will soon look at in more detail, so he introduced two immaterial principles which he called love and strife, which caused the four elements to congregate and separate. The last philosophical schools that attempted to answer the question of underlying reality that we will look at was the Pythagorean school. This school was founded by the philosopher Pythagoras, and its philosophers mostly lived around the Greek colonies near southern Italy. The Pythagoreans claimed, if we're going to interpret what they said literally, that ultimate reality is numerical rather than material. Exactly how they thought that the material world could be reduced to numbers we don't know, and it's important to remember that most of the information we have about the Pythagorean philosophy comes from later philosophers who were not themselves Pythagoreans, and likely did not fully understand the Pythagorean teaching. If the most prominent philosophical problem of the 6th century was the question of the origins and fundamental ingredients of the world, a related issue came to dominate the philosophical enterprise during the 5th century BC, and that was the question of change. Is change even possible? And if it is, then how? For a person living in the 21st century, this probably seems to be a ludicrous question, but with a little effort we may be able to understand its saliency for the 5th century philosophers. This was a question that was deeply metaphysical, and were not asked by laymen in the context of everyday life. Remember that many philosophers during this period were materialists and monists in that they thought that matter was the fundamental stuff of the universe. However, if the universe is fundamentally material, what causes the individual building blocks to move? Matter is passive, and is not moved by any inherent nature, and if matter are all that exists, there can be no external forces that causes the individual building blocks to move and collide with each other. Furthermore, if matter is the fundamental stuff of the universe, it should be unchangeable and not subject to generation, corruption or alteration which is something that we experience in everyday life. The most well-known and radical treatment of the question of change were done by the philosopher Parmenides and his student Zeno. Parmenides started to tackle the question of change by denying on various logical grounds that a thing could pass from non-existence into existence, since this would apply that you could get something from nothing, which is an impossibility. Then, on analogous grounds, Parmenides argued that it's impossible for a thing to undergo change. He argued that if thing A becomes B, either A was already B, in that A contained some kind of B-ness, 
or A was not already B. If A was already B before it became B, then no change occurred. However, if A was not already B, then A's change into B would require the acquisition of some kind of B-ness from something that did not possess that kind of quality, which brings us back to the impossibility to get something out of nothing. In either case no change occurred, and the conclusion Parmenides drawn from the reasoning was that change is impossible and must therefore be an illusion. The philosopher Zeno extended and defended Parmenides' doctrine of the impossibility of change with a set of proofs against the possibility of change of motion, which he argued could be extended to other kinds of changes. His most famous proof is the stadium paradox. Zeno argued that it's impossible to traverse from point A to point B, because in order to do this you must first cover half of the length between the points. And before you do that, you must first cover one quarter. And before you do that, you must first cover one eighth. And so on into infinity. From that reasoning, Zeno argued that change of motion is impossible. Because in order to move from point A to point B, you have to traverse an infinite sequences of halves in a finite time, which he argued is impossible. Now, not all philosophers accepted Parmenides and Zeno's radical stance that change is impossible. The philosopher Empedocles, who we mentioned earlier, answered the question of change with that his theory of the four material elements, plus the forces of love and strife, resulted in that the elements did not come into being or pass away, but that they congregated, separates and mixes into various portions from which it follows that both change and stability are genuine. Democritus and Lycippus also answered this question by granting that the individual atoms that they claimed was the fundamental stuff of the universe was absolutely immutable in that they were not subject to generation, corruption or alteration, but that they at the same time were perpetually moving, colliding and congregating, and that through various motions and configurations of the atoms the endless variety in the world of our sense experience is produced. According to the atomists, therefore stability of the underlying reality, which are the atoms, causes change on the sensory level, from which it follows that both change and stability are genuine. Poking through the discussion of the underlying reality and the problem of change, one issue that soon caught the minds of the pre-Socratic philosophers was the question of knowledge. The question of knowledge is implicit in the quest for the fundamental reality underlying the variety of substances revealed by the senses. If the senses do not reveal what intellect attests, such as fundamental stability, are we then to abandon them in the guidance of truth? Most pre-Socratic philosophers answered yes to this question. Parmenides and Zeno dismissed the senses since their radical stance on the question of change implied that change is impossible, and since the senses reveal the world in which change takes place, they must be unreliable, and from that it follows that truth is only to be obtained by the exercise of reason. This denigration of sense experience was shared by the atomist philosophers, since according to them, the senses only revealed secondary qualities, whereas reason, they argued, taught that only the atoms and the void are all that truly exists. It's important to remember though, that even if many of the pre-Socratic philosophers were inclined to favor reason over the senses, this tendency was neither universal nor without qualification. Some philosophers, like Empedocles, defended the senses against the attacks from the materialist philosophers. They claimed that the senses may not be perfect, but that they could be useful guidance in the search for truth, if they are employed discriminately, which was a view that was shared by the last philosopher that we will cover in this video. Okay, okay. Before the philosopher buffs in the audience start to accuse me for not having a clue of what I'm talking about, hear me out. Plato is not a pre-Socratic philosopher, in that he was a student of Socrates, and highly influenced by him to say the least. Because of this, Plato should technically not be part of this video, since it's supposed to cover the pre-Socratic period. Here's the thing though, 
Plato is a very important character in the history of ancient science and philosophy, but unlike Aristotle, I don't consider him to be important enough to get his own video, and it's going to be hard to shoehorn him into any of the other videos that I'm planning to do on the subject of ancient science, which is why I'm choosing to include him here. Now that we have that out of the way, let's talk about the ideas of Plato. Often confused with that sweet clay you ate when you were a child, Plato was a Greek philosopher who lived between the years 427 and 348 BC. He was a student of the philosopher Socrates, and is well known among other things for writing all of his works in dialogue form. In order to assess Plato's thoughts and their relevance to the history of ancient science, it's appropriate to start with his metaphysics. In a passage in his book called The Republic, Plato reflected on the relationship between a carpenter and a table that the carpenter builds. When a carpenter builds a table, he or she replicates the mental idea of a table that exists in their mind as closely as possible, but the final product will always be imperfect, since no two manufactured tables are alike down to the smallest detail, and limitations in the material ensures that none of the tables that the carpenter ever makes will fully measure up to the ideal table that exists in the carpenter's mind. According to Plato, there exists a divine craftsman who bears the same relationship to the cosmos as the carpenter bears to his table. The divine craftsman, or demiurge as Plato called him, constructed the cosmos according to an idea or plan, so that the cosmos and everything in it are replicas of eternal ideas or forms that will always be imperfect because of the limitations inherent in the material available to the demiurge. In short, there are two realms. One realm of forms or ideas containing the perfect form of everything, and one material realm in which these forms are imperfectly replicated. The world of forms is eternal, unchanging and incorporeal, in that it's not spatial, to speak of the form's location is meaningless, and in contrast to the world of forms, the material world in which we live in will always be imperfect, transitionary, and dependent on the world of forms for its existence. The idea of the world of forms and its relationship to the material world is famously expressed in Plato's allegory of the cave, which I will not go over here, since it has been well explained many times by other channels. So in the context of the world of forms, how do Plato try to answer the questions raised by the pre-Socratic philosophers regarding fundamental reality, change and human knowledge? For a start, Plato claimed that the world of forms was the underlying reality, while he assigned secondary existence to the material world. Secondly, Plato made room for both change and stability, assigning them to each level of reality, where change and transition takes place in the physical world, while the world of forms which the physical world depends on is characterized by stability. When it came to the question of knowledge, Plato placed reason, or true understanding as he called it, in opposition to the senses. According to Plato, far from leading upward to true knowledge and understanding, the senses are chains that keep us down, and it follows that the true route to knowledge is philosophical reflection. However, it would be misleading to assume that Plato dismissed the senses altogether, and he did accept that sense experience could serve various useful functions, especially when it came to guide the mind towards the world of forms. Plato claimed that the observation of certain sensible objects, especially those with geometrical properties, could serve to guide the soul towards nobler objects in the realm of forms, and that idea was a driving in sentiment for Plato and his followers' great interest in astronomy, which we will look at more closely in another video. Secondly, Plato argued that sense experience may actually stir the memory and remind the soul of the forms that it had known in prior existence, thus stimulating a process of recollection that will lead to actual knowledge of the forms. One of the most important aspects of Plato's thoughts from a scientific perspective was the way he assigned reality to the world of forms. According to Plato, the bearer of true reality are not the individual objects that exist in the material world, but the idealized form of the objects that are imperfectly shared by all the objects combined. And to gain true knowledge we must set aside the characteristics of peculiar things and seek the shared characteristics that define them into classes. 
This view has a distinctly modern ring to it, since idealization is a prominent feature of a great deal of modern science, due to the fact that scientists work to develop models that overlook the incidental in favor of the essential. So, if we try to summarize the achievements of the pre-Socratic philosophers, what can we say about them? If we survey the early Greek philosophy with a modern eye, certain pieces of it look familiar. The pre-Socratic inquiry into the shape and arrangement of the cosmos, its origins and fundamental ingredients, reminds us of questions that are still being investigated in modern cosmology and particle physics. But some pieces of the early Greek philosophy, on the other hand, looks considerably more foreign. Scientists today do not inquire whether change is logically possible, or how to balance claims of reason and observation. These matters are simply no longer discussed among scientists, and the question that then arises is whether pondering such questions are to be seen as a waste of time, and whether the philosophers who devoted their lives to them should be seen as misguided or intellectually deficient. The question need to be handled with some delicacy, and it's probably best answered in this way. Themes such as the identity of ultimate reality, the distinction between natural and supernatural, the source of order in the universe, the nature of change, and the foundations of knowledge are quite different from the explanations of experimental data, but to be different is not to be unuseful or insignificant. At least until the late 17th century, these questions demanded much attention from the students of nature, and they were both interesting and essential because they were part of an effort to create conceptual foundations and vocabulary for investigating the world. Unfortunately, it is often the fate of fundamental questions to seem pointless to later generations who take their foundations for granted. However, for the early philosophers, the investigation of nature had to start from the only place possible, which is to tackle the questions regarding the philosophical assumptions on which the scientific enterprise is based on, and that is essentially what we have covered in this video. Not really questions about physics and astronomy, but rather abstract philosophical questions in which the framework for answering questions of physics and astronomy can be attained. It's not strange that such questions have been resolved or fallen out of favor, but that does not make them any less interesting for the historian, since it's the historian's role to appreciate the enterprise in all of its diversity, to quote the historian David C. Lindbergh. If the garden of the early philosophers is situated at the beginning of the road to modern science, then the historian of science may profitably dally in its shady corners before embarking on its journey. That will be all for this video. I hope you liked it and that you learned something new about early Greek philosophy and science. Don't forget that if you like this video and want to see more videos like it, hit the like, share and subscribe buttons.